Throughout this course, we've been focusing on attempting to gain analytical tractability for these very complex systems. And that requires reducing them, modeling them, ignoring all sorts of high order effects in order to get something that we can write down with paper and pencil or symbolically crunch on a computer and get as close as possible to closed form equations. The utility of this is that we can understand closed form equations. We can study them, we can predict them for all time without having to resort to numerical methods. However, eventually you hit a point where this reduced fidelity modeling is insufficient. And this will happen both in the analysis of naturally occurring systems and in trajectory planning. At the end of the day, you will have to take your first cut trajectories and numerically integrate them. As we've been going along and developing analytical intuition and closed form expressions, we have also been relying heavily on numerical methods, but we haven't really bothered to look under the hood. And that's wrong because you really shouldn't be using black box methods. You should try to always understand what your tools are doing for you. So we are now going to turn to a study of numerical methods and first in particular, numerical integration. And we are going to begin with a review of numerical integration for initial value problems. An initial value problem is stated formally as follows. For some state vector X, which is a collection of n real values, we have an initial condition x evaluated at a time t naught is equal to some state vector x naught. And we have a function f, which maps real values and time to another set of real values, such that f of the vector x and time gives you the time derivative of x. We wish to find the state evaluated at some arbitrary time t where t is within the initial condition t naught and goes to positive or negative infinity. So we can integrate forwards in time or we can integrate backwards in time. For our systems, this independent variable is always time, but in general, it can be anything. The first question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we know whether there exists a solution at all? The answer to this is given by something called the picard lindelof or also the Cauchy-Lipschitz theorem. This theorem states, if this function f, which gives the time derivative of the state, is Lipschitz continuous in x and continuous in t, then there exists a unique solution for x of t, where t is in some range t naught minus epsilon to t naught plus epsilon for some epsilon greater than zero. So there's a lot going on in this definition. Let's unpack it piece by piece. This function f has to be Lipschitz continuous. A real valued function f that maps from a real value to a real value is called Lipschitz continuous if there exists a real positive constant, let's say k, such that the difference, the absolute difference between f evaluated at some value x1 and f evaluated at some value x2 is going to be smaller or equal to this constant k times the absolute difference between x1 and x2 for all pairs x1 and x2. What this is telling you is that we can consider this function to be this Lipschitz continuous thing if we can map the difference between the function evaluation on two different values to arbitrarily small intervals. So we have a function. It's well-behaved in this fashion, such that it's Lipschitz continuous, and it is also continuous in time. And therefore, we can find a solution for anything in this range by once again bracketing it to some arbitrary values between these epsilons. The sketch of the proof of this is as follows. We integrate the original differential equation, and we can write xt minus x of t naught is equal to the integral from t naught to t of the evaluation of f, which is a function of x and time. Here we replace time of this dummy variable s, and we are integrating over s. The true solution, which we will call phi of t, can be approximated iteratively via a process known as Picard iteration. So in this process, we take iterants of phi, phi sub k evaluated at time t, 
and the kth plus one iterant is going to be given by the initial conditions, our x naught values, plus the integral from t naught to t of our function f evaluated at the previous iterant of phi, phi sub k of s and s over ds. If this function f of x of t happens to be independent of time, if f of x t is just f of x, then we would be able to solve this via numerical quadrature. Otherwise, we have to model the dependence on time. We can do so by expanding x about the point x of t sub k, t sub k. And what that will look like is phi, recall the true solution at some time t k plus one, will be phi at t sub k plus the integral from t k to t k plus one of our function f evaluated on phi and s integrated over s. So note now that this is a different iterant. Previously, we were iterating on the value of phi itself. Now we are iterating on the evaluation of phi at different time points. From this, we write our expansion in a Taylor series as usual. And it takes this form. So phi evaluated at the next time point, tk plus 1, looks like phi at t sub k plus the difference between tk plus 1 and t sub k, which we will call delta t, times the first partial in phi in time evaluated at the previous time point, t sub k, plus delta t squared over 2 times the second derivative of phi in t at tk, plus higher order terms of order delta t cubed and onwards. So we can directly adapt this to an iterative scheme for evaluating our state as time flows along. And if we just do this to first order, then we can write down two linearized schemes, the first being xk plus 1 is equal to xk plus delta t times our function evaluated at xk and tk. And this is the forward Euler method. And this is an explicit method because it is evaluating f on things that we already know. We have our current state xk, and so we are evaluating f on the thing that we know about. Or alternatively, we can write down the same kind of scheme, except we can evaluate our function at the next iterant time point, f of xk plus 1, tk plus 1. This is known as the backward Euler method, and this is implicit because we would have to invert this function, usually iteratively, sometimes if we're lucky analytically, in order to be able to propagate this forward. So we now have methods for approximating how our state is being propagated along by our dynamics, by this gradient function f. How do we quantify the error in this approximation? Because remember, this is an approximation. We have taken just the linearization of the true dynamics here, or of the true mathematical process that is carrying our state along. And so we need to be able to figure out exactly how much error we're introducing by dropping these higher order terms. So in order to quantify the error, we return to our Taylor expansion, and we define the truncation error at time point k plus 1, or at step k plus 1, as the absolute difference between x of k plus 1 and the true solution, the true state, sometimes known as the flow, phi of t k plus 1. For the forward Euler method, we can thus write the local truncation error as the absolute value of x of k plus 1 plus delta t times our function f evaluated at x of k t sub k. So this is what our forward Euler method is producing for the next step. And then we are subtracting the expansion of the true solution. So minus 5 tk minus delta t times f evaluated at 5 tk and tk minus delta t squared over 2 times the second partial of phi in time evaluated at tk plus the higher order terms, which we will kind of ignore from now on. By the cauchy schwartz inequality, we can write, that is, the local truncation error at k plus 1 is less than or equal to the local truncation error at the previous time step, e sub k, which Recall, we can write as xk minus phi at t sub k, absolute value, 
plus the absolute difference between the function evaluated at x sub k, t sub k, minus f of phi at tk, tk times delta t, plus the second order term, delta t squared over 2, times the absolute value of the second derivative in phi in time evaluated at t sub k. Here's where the fact that f has to be Lipschitz continuous comes into play. This entire term must be less than or equal to some constant k, which is the Lipschitz constant, also occasionally called the Lipschitz bound, which you will recall is a positive value times xk minus phi of tk. Therefore, we can rewrite the local truncation error as e of k plus 1 is less than or equal to e sub k plus the Lipschitz bound, capital K, times e sub k times delta t plus m delta t squared over 2, where m is defined as the maximum value over all time of the second partial of phi in time. So that is this term here. We can simplify this algebraically and write e of k plus 1 is less than or equal to 1 plus k delta t times e sub k plus m delta t squared over 2. This is the statement of the local truncation error for the forward Euler method. And from this, we can also define a global truncation error, which is that the absolute value of e k plus 1 is less than or equal to delta t times that m value, which is the maximum of the absolute value of the second partial of phi in time, over 2 times the Lipschitz bound, times the exponential of k times t minus t naught minus 1. We now have provided ourselves with two different error metrics. One of them, the local truncation error, is telling us how much error we're accumulating from step to step due to the local linearization of our propagation. The second one is telling us how much error we're accumulating globally as a result of carrying through all of these propagations one after another. The forward Euler method can be unstable, especially for stiff equations. What is a stiff equation? Well, a stiff equation is one where your numerical integrator runs into problems, which I know sounds maddeningly circular, but that is literally the best way to define it. So formally, a differential equation is called stiff if certain numerical methods, such as the forward Euler method, for solving it go unstable unless you use incredibly small step sizes. We can provide a, another definition of stability, which is a little bit more rigorous. And we do this by considering the system x dot is equal to kx. So in this case, we have just a one-dimensional system. We take an initial condition x at time t equals 0 equal to 1. And k is going to be a complex value. This system has a solution. x of t is equal to the exponential kt. The solution will go to 0 in the limit as t goes to infinity for any real part of k being less than or equal to 0. We've already encountered something like this when we talked about the stability of equilibrium points in the linear system analysis. We want equilibrium points to be in the left-hand plane, to have negative real parts, in order for them to be stable, in order for things to damp out as time flows to infinity. So the same thing is happening here. A numerical method with this behavior for a fixed step size. So any numerical method that does not blow up if you propagate in a fixed step size delta t is called a-stable. The forward Euler method is explicitly not a-stable. And that is why it runs into so much trouble with stiff equations. The backward Euler is a stable, but cannot always be solved because of its implicit nature, other than by numerical iteration at each step, which can be incredibly costly from a computational standpoint. A few more definitions. A numerical method has order p when the local truncation error, e sub k, is of order delta t to the p plus 1 as delta t goes to 0. The Euler methods, both forward and backward, are order one. So order p really tells you about the order of linearization that you're approximating. The runge kutta methods, which we will introduce shortly, are of arbitrarily higher order. And finally, a numerical method is called consistent 
if the limit as delta t goes to zero of the ratio of the local truncation error e sub k to the step size delta t goes to zero as well.